Welcome to this lecture on feminist criticism. As you are aware, we are in a series of lectures under brought under the broad ages of English language and literature. This course is being recorded under the ages of the national program on technology enhanced learning an initiative by the Indian Institutes of Technology and the Indian Institute of Science. We are in the fourth module of the series of lectures and we have been already been through a few um, you know few lectures on literary criticism and you will recall that the last lecture was on Marxist literary criticism. And today, we are going to devote this lecture to feminist criticism. Let me begin by saying um, here at the beginning of this lecture that this lecture is not an advanced level lecture. This lecture is going to talk broadly about feminist criticism um, uh, beginning with the feminist movement and will bring to you a few core concepts in feminist literary criticism. As you are also aware, these lectures are being brought uh, to you, um, to, you know, to a, a broad spectrum of uh, viewers all right, but the target audience comprises students in engineering colleges uh, for whom the, elect, uh, you know, uh, the humanities and social sciences subjects are brought as electives. Okay. So, let us do a recap first of what we did in our last lecture, which was devoted to Marxist literary criticism. And you will recall that historical materialism is um, one of the important, um, how should I put it, one of the important uh, descriptive and theoretical terms used to, uh, you know, we used to talk about Marxism. Okay. So, why do we call it historical materialism? We found that the two most important questions or rather the two core questions asked here are A, how are societies organized and structured and how do societies develop and change. Okay. So, you will note here that um, a is the structure of societies. Okay. If we have to make sense of societies, we first have to look at the way they are organized and structured. And second, we have to account, we know that all societies change, we have to then account uh, for why social change happens, why societies evolve from one stage to the other. Then we found that even if even as we talk about Marxist literary criticism, okay, we cannot do without the two most perhaps most important terms given to us by Karl Marx that is the base, the economic base and the superstructure and we placed art in the superstructure okay, along with other components like consciousness, religion, education, family and the legal system. And then we said after Karl Marx that the base, the economic base which comprises the relations of production and the forces of production determine without being deterministic, okay, determine the features or characteristics or nature of the components of the superstructure, which also meant that literary texts will be would be determined by the economic base of the period in which they were written. Of course, it is not as simplistic as it sounds, right. There are different ways in which literary texts, creative writers will engage okay, with different elements of both the base and the superstructure. Their responses, their reactions would take different forms. In some cases, we would find that a text, a literary text um, would you know be with right the dominant ideologies of its time whereas another literary te text may uh, you know make uh, quite severely critique okay the um, the status quo of the 
uh, times concerned. Okay? So, these are the two terms we found we cannot do without when we talk about literary criticism, we cannot brush them aside as sort of clearly or purely Marxist concepts or concepts from political science or sociology. Okay? Then we saw a quotation from uh, Plekhanov, okay, who said very rightly that the social mentality of an age is conditioned by that age's social relations. Okay. And where did we come across the word social relations? Remember in the previous slide, we came across relations of production or social relations as being part of the economic base. So, the social mentality right, of an age will be conditioned, look at the word condition. Okay. He rightly uses the word condition, because we are not talking about a deterministic causal okay, of a pure causality the social relations of an age will be conditioned by that age's social, uh, uh, sorry social mentality will be con conditioned by that age's social relations. And then he says, this is nowhere quite as evident as in the history of art and literature. Okay? This changing social mentality or the fact, this conditioning okay, of social mentality by social relations is according to Plekhanov the most evident or is indicated uh, you know um, or is m most evident as he uses the word most evident in the history of art and literature. That is the entire history of art or the entire history of literature may be read as changing mentalities, social changing social mentalities okay, given changing social relations. Okay. So, this really you know is the crux of Marxist literary criticism. Then um, I, we also saw this, we, say, we said that well we uh, uh, you know after we have known uh, the basic tenets of Marxism of historical materialism that are useful for us as literary scholars, then what is the method by which we analyze a text or by which we analyze a literary period or a literary movement. Okay. So, here are some of the examples which I have taken uh, you know uh, from several um, you know from several authors. For instance, let us look at the first question. You may ask a question like what ideology or ideologies does the text or literary movement reinforce as okay. Uh, does it reinforce the dominant ideology? Let us look at this uh, quickly, because we have already talked about this in the last lecture. In what ways does the text reveal and invite us to attest to or to condemn the ideology? And how far is the text ideologically straightforward or conflicted or is uh, you know how far is it propagandist? So, these are and other uh, you know points are these are some of the things that you may ask of a text, if you are um, you know planning to do a Marxist literary analysis. Okay, fine. So, now we will move on to the topic of discussion, our topic of discussion today that is feminist criticism. And uh, of course, fe feminist criticism is a very well established field and there are so many textbooks, so many handbooks, so many you know critical anthologies that you may use for an understanding of um, feminist literary criticism. What I have done here is I have uh, selected a few texts, uh, so that you know, um, you, know, I ca you know my lecture uh, draws upon these right and I shall be quoting from these also using examples. So, our first book is Wilfred Guerin's A Handbook of Critical Approaches to Literature, then Malpas and Paul Wake's The Routledge Companion to Critical Theory, the essay uh, by um, Susan Heckman in this um, you know collection uh, entitled Feminism, that is the text that we are taking up. And uh, an another book that has been with us in all our lectures, almost all our lectures that is Pramod K. Nair's Contemporary Literary and Cultural Theory and two more uh, books which you know would help us point to a post feminist approach and um, among which we find Judith Butler's Gender Trouble and Bodies That Matter to be useful for our purposes. Okay. Again, let me remind you, these are by no means you, you know the texts or you know um, the only text that is uh, you know that you may read. Okay. There are several other, other books and we will first begin by reading from the Routledge Companion to Critical Theory. So, let us now read 
from the Rutledge Companion to Critical Theory. As I had mentioned, this essay is by Susan Hickman, entitled Feminism. Now, let us look at this carefully. Since its inception, feminism has passed through a number of different stages. This is what is very important. We need to keep in mind that feminism A is not temporarily or over time a homogeneous discourse or a homogeneous uh, you know um, analytical tool okay, for, for literary or cultural analysis. Nor is it spatially that is over different uh, you know uh, different geographical spaces and nations and states uh, you know feminism is not homogeneous right. Uh, it is important for us to note that today there are what we may call various feminisms like we say there are various Englishes okay, in the world. So, also there are various feminisms, okay. uh, there are various feminist discourses right, that talk about the issue of women and gender from various perspectives and these have also uh, no doubt enriched the whole field of feminist studies. Okay. So, with Heckman we, we come to learn right at the beginning that feminism is not to be taken as a temporally and spatially homogeneous term. Okay. So, again since its inception it has passed through a number of different stages. In the 19th and early 20th centuries liberal feminism look now these are important terms okay. liberal feminism and socialist feminism uh, allied feminism with the dominant political theories of the day. So, among uh, you know the early um, now when I say early does not mean that these schools or these approaches in feminism and feminist literary theory that did, I do not do not mean or do not mean in any way to suggest that these are you know old theories and that they are not relevant today. Okay. However, we, we trace it from uh, the 19th century and early 20th century and we say that uh, there were basically two schools the liberal uh, feminist school and the socialist fem uh, feminist school which the social feminist school draws obviously from uh, draws its uh, main um, analytical tools from socialism or from Marxism okay. and these were allied I mean they were not separated really these were allied to the general political theories of their time. Do you follow? Okay. For instance, socialist feminism uh, would um, draw its discourse okay, by seeing women in terms of a class, okay, would uh, consider women uh, to be analogous to the working class for instance to an exploited class and uh, the discourse would be you generally built around this political uh, you know political um, focus okay, of looking at women as um, you know akin to an oppressed class. Okay. So, then Heckman goes on to say beginning in the 1960s however, feminist feminists developed approaches that did not depend on male defined theories. Now, what she suggests here you know she seems to suggest here that a liberal you know the liberal approaches or the Marxist approaches were basically theories that were made by made by uh, or made from so to speak uh, already established discourses which were, she calls male defined theories. For instance, then you uh, already have theories and you just simply have to see women in the light of say in Marxist feminism in the light of an oppressed class. right? So, then she goes on to say radical feminism, psychoanalytic feminism, the feminisms now look at this word the feminisms of women of color and postmodern feminism are attempts to develop analysis of women's role in society from a woman's perspective this is very important okay there, there seems now to be you know uh, in um, beginning from the middle of the 20th century there seems to uh, be a change you know uh, they a plethora of different ways of sort of doing feminism for instance radical feminism or postmodern feminism or psychoanalytic feminism which psycho in the case of psychoanalytic feminist criticism moving away from a basic Freudian model okay, uh, to, to a model 
in which we find women talking about uh, you know uh, from a psychoanalytic perspective which differs from the older Freudian uh, model for instance of the castration uh, uh, anxiety model for instance. Okay. So, these are re-readings of Freud in the psychoanalytic domain. So, uh, these feminisms okay, radical, postmodern, psychoanalytic etcetera are at once feminist movements, social political feminist movements uh, that also sort of spawned, that also spawned different critical um, you know uh, or, or feminisms with different, different critical shades each being different from the other. This really if you look at it carefully and if you go on to read in these areas are, are uh, extremely rich okay, in their nuanced differences, both nuanced and both you know uh, quite forthrightly political okay, differences among themselves. Okay. So, again radical psychoanalytic uh, for instance the feminisms of women of color for instance. Okay. Uh, one of the most important things um, slogans that were raised was that the when you talk about feminism uh, for a long time you know the category woman was read seen and understood in terms of white middle class women. The problems of women all over the world okay, were explored were seen as being akin to the problems of okay, women. Uh, the white western woman. Okay. So, um, I would not use the word recent of course, it has been uh, quite many years okay. uh, yeah, that they, there have been decades of work where for instance the word uh, you know the, the word womanism being preferred by many African American uh, or many um, African women writers okay, uh, in place of feminism right. They found the word feminism to sort of separatist okay, or radical or uh, a term and they tried to uh, you know or they suggested that the word womanism okay, would be more uh, you know appropriate in, in, in uh, you know in uh, indicating right um, uh, the cultural situation of uh, black women for instance. Okay. So, you see that uh, from uh, you know from li basically liberal socialist approaches okay, which drew their terminology, their discourses, um, their orientations from uh, already established male uh, uh, you know what she calls here the male uh, defined theories okay, came to have um, different shades and uh, came to have uh, you know different orientations for instance okay in which a woman's perspective was sought to be upheld next i read on these approaches analyze how gender is constructed and maintained this is i would say one of the most important sentence here these approaches analyze how gender is constructed and maintained as one of the central meaning structures of society now quickly let's let's look at the term gender right we uh, in feminist criticism differentiate between the two terms sex and gender okay so sex of course this is no longer the entire you know story regarding sex and gender, but there was an important differentiation made uh, in you know um, in I would say the middle of the 20th century. Okay, an important difference was made between sex and gender, and one of the first uh, most important formulations came from a philosopher, a French philosopher, who you are I'm sure at least you've heard of. Okay, this is Simone de Beauvoir in her famous text the second sex okay the second sex obviously refers to women and in this book there is a you know uh, there is a famous uh, statement that came to be uh, you know um, upheld as sort of the slogan of uh, you know of feminism of a certain kind a feminism of a certain uh, you could say or a certain uh, time period right uh, the statement was that um, a, a, a woman is 
you know a, a woman is not born but a woman is rather constructed you know i'm not quoting her verbatim okay one is not born uh, that's how it goes uh, one is not born but rather becomes a woman okay so this is the important difference so you see sex is of course a biological identity okay and in this uh, you know uh, um, the discourse of feminism in this time usually the today it is not the no, uh, not the way we do it talked about two sexes male and female so when a child is born it is usually a male or a female child okay but as woover says one is not born but rather becomes a woman woover says that it is social con conditioning or social construction okay that gives us the other part of the story that is no if you remember when you read grammar in school okay we found we, we didn't in, in in gender when we talked about gender in grammar we didn't use the word the terms male and female what were the terms that we use we use the terms feminine okay feminine and masculine right there is another one that is neuter or neuter as some call it right so what does this imply this implies okay that gender sex is when we talk about sex we talk about you know we should use the terms male and female and we talk about gender we should use the terms feminine or masculine okay so feminine and masculine are therefore not physiological not so much physiological attributes as behavioral at attributes okay so feminine kind of behavior is a behavior pattern or a behavior uh, tendency that is not necessarily with us when we are born okay the so called masculine tendencies according to this schema is not something that a, that a, a male child is you know inherently sort of um, born with right these behavior patterns are patterns to which you know in which we are brought up you know in the process of socializ socializations by our parents first and then that is our family or extended family and then by us uh, by our educational system and by in, by uh, society in general hence it is said one one is not born a woman but becomes one or we may also say one is not born a male but uh, or man or becomes one to follow okay so what did we learn here we learned two very important terms here that is a distinction uh, the uh, now which by now we of course we call this traditionalist descrip uh, you know descriptions of sex and gender okay uh, with post feminism this has become a bit more complex so i'll go uh, move on to that a while later but uh, we would still have to acknowledge the fact that that this a uh, sort of division between sex and gender was a very important theoretical conceptual description uh, for the establishment of feminism as a discourse okay for the establishment of feminist literary criticism for instance now in this stage for instance if you look at a female character in a novel what would you do you would then try to understand okay uh, so many things about the, the uh, you know the character for instance her desires okay her goals in life or sometimes the lack thereof okay uh, her patterns of behavior her emotions okay and you would as a feminist critic right look at all these attributes as emanating from uh, the way the character was socialized okay so you then also look at the way in which the dialogues that are given to the woman character okay and then you would place her uh, you know in um, the general um, milieu socio cultural milieu of the age okay or the era or the period that uh, in which the uh, the play or the novel or even the poem is set and that is how you account for such behavior right you also then talk about uh both male and female characters and their attributes and also the way the plot runs in the text as the writer's understanding okay and there are sometimes the writer's intervention uh, in a given socio cultural milieu so these are the some of the ways in which okay feminist criticism was done following 
right uh, following the division of sex uh, sorry or division in, uh, or you know or understanding of these two terms okay that is separating gender from the main term sex do you follow okay so let's now return to our slides um fine the next slide uh, here is a very important term okay that is patriarchy this is a term that uh, you are some of you are aware of okay patriarchy comes from the term the root term pater okay pater the root term pater meaning some of you may have got it father okay and archi archi means rule of or rule by okay so patriarchy means rule of the father or rule by the father okay obviously first in the family right so the father is traditionally understood as the head of the family the father is traditionally understood as uh, you know uh, the main source of earning for the family also the one who sets the rules and regulations uh, you know of the family so the rule by the father is first at a family level but when uh, you know uh, feminist critics realized that patriarchy was not simply a family phenomenon it was a larger okay social or even global phenomenon okay it also meant not simply the rule by the father or the setting up of rules by the father okay uh, the domination of the other members of the family like the wife and the children okay by the father it also meant suggested that all all the norms rules and regulations uh, we can even say of most communities right most nations uh, in the world are in favor of the male sex to follow okay so patriarchy then obviously as you can imagine became the target right of um, you know uh, 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 of staunch uh, you know attack we may use the word in in radical feminism in feminist protest movements okay and also patriarchy became the discourse right it became the discourse by which feminist critics tried to understand right try to understand the representation of uh, women and of course of male characters in literature that is how are women represented in literature is a text showing a clearly patriarchal inclination okay or is the writer and in this case uh, the you know the the works of women writers who were hitherto uh, you know not a part or an important part of uh, the canon you remember women writers of the 19th century and even before that in uh, you know in in england had to write using pseudonyms had to write write using uh, male uh, names do you follow uh, and in in order you know to hide the fact that these were women writing okay so there were many such cultural phenomena that are also looked into or also studied by feminism but we have to understand that patriarchy is essentially the the discourse is essentially the discourse that is explored critiqued and sought to be dismantled by feminist both feminist movements and feminist literary criticism okay now what does patriarchy give us patriarchy is all about ideologies a and what is an ideology an ideology may be defined as a world view okay as a world view or it is defined as a set of values for instance and norms and regulations through which you view the world all of us have an ideology do you understand so if uh, we are uh, tremendously religious then we look at the world and and, uh, and the reasons for our existence therein from a religious point of view or from a religious world view and this um uh, this um determines okay or conditions even that is conditions our 
uh, values conditions our uh, beliefs conditions our desires and the actions that we take up right so patriarchy is therefore a set of ideologies a set of world views right then obviously patriarchy is not you know when you say it's a rule of the father patriarchy is also power structures or structures of power in which uh, you know uh, uh, the male is the norm and the female is the deviant patriarchy also okay has a lot of say you could say or a lot of power over how things are represented okay uh, you only have to look at popular culture for instance you have to look at popular um, for for instance popular novels in our, in our time the mills and moon uh, 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 you know romances okay they, uh, if you if you work on these novels you'll find clearly a stereotype of woman and even the stereotype of man that is being shown in these novels okay so patriarchy also has a hold or at least has to uh, you know till recent times has had a hold over what is represented and how and finally obviously patriarchy has a hold over our material lives okay now what do we mean by our material lives our material lives are the you know basically the uh, you know the way we live our lives from an economic point of view from from things that have to do with matter okay things have to do with wealth and power okay our material lives are also our everyday lives for instance i'll give you a very small example there was a time not very long ago okay when um, when food was laid out in a family for the entire family uh, you know it was quite the norm and you and many quite accept accepted the fact that um, you know the uh, you know the the plate or the dish or what we call the thali in india uh, for the man the head of the family would be much larger than than the ones that were given to the other members of the family okay you see so many movies of a certain films of a certain era in which you always see the man being first served by the woman of the family okay and only then you know uh, in after she has looked after the children next okay she partakes of whatever is left okay so material lives is not simply big economics that we are talking about we are also talking about everyday lives okay which as i saw you also includes the use um, uh, of certain in utensils of certain sizes for certain people right so patriarchy has to do with as we saw here ideologies power structures representations and our material lives now when you look at a text when you look at a novel or a short story or a poem you know one of the first things you do uh, you know to when you first begin to do feminist literary criticism at an elementary level is you try to to see the you know um, you try to see how patriarchy plays an important part in the setup of the novel okay or uh, you know in 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 the entire you could say the the entire ambience of the novel you see you look at the ideologies the world views that are subscribed to by the characters and then you find out why okay certain characters are shown in a certain light you see the past structures for instance family for instance you see if there is a family being depicted you see what the power dynamics are okay in that family and you also see how the writer has represented how uh, how the sexes are represented what is seen as feminine fem, you know appropriately feminine behavior what is seen as for instance the mills and boon uh, romances that i talked about appropriately feminine behavior is very evident as also appropriately uh, masculine behavior you follow and you see the material uh, the material setting the material not just the setting the you know um, uh, 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 you know beginning from the props starting with the props okay starting right to the to the the distribution of wealth and you know labor in the novel and you will find whether it is a patriarchal novel or whether that novel is a strong uh, you know a critique of a patriarchal system okay so these are some of the you know ways in which you begin to look at texts in feminist literary criticism now therefore there are some uh, uh, there are a few names that i would like to bring to you because these are these names are important uh, at least a few of them in, in the establishment of the feminist movement and of feminist criticism 
and the first name we have to take obviously is the name of um, uh, the, the British feminist uh, Mary Wollstonecraft whose vindication of the rights of women are uh, is uh, one of the most famous books and uh, you can well imagine uh, you know this um, book was published in 1798 which is uh, you know end of the 18th century in England and uh, uh, you know Mary Wollstonecraft wrote in her vindication okay called for she called for uh, you know uh, upholding the rights of women and she describes in that you know that piece of work it is a beautiful piece of work in which she describes uh, you know how women are conditioned right this is one of the first and foremost books that one reads and it is really the beginning of uh, you know western feminism if we may put it that way. Then we come to writers American writers like Betty uh, Friedan and Kate Millett. Uh, Betty Friedan's book The Feminine Mystique. Okay. The Feminine Mystique is uh, a piece of work that shows you know how femin uh, the feminine qualities right. Uh, feminine qualities are uh, women are indoctrinated into the feminine qualities and how it remains uh, sort of as the title suggests a mystique. Okay. Uh, next Kate Millett's book uh, Sexual Politics is one such early book that delved into literature we went on to talk about how the representation and the politics of sexuality, the politics of gender in um, you know in um, certain canonized writers so D. H. Lawrence for instance and talked about the representation and the sexual politics the, you know in those novels. Then we came to an important another important book by Elaine Showalter, Elaine Showalter's A Literature of Her Own. A literature okay, of her own. Obviously, those of you who are from literature would understand that it is a you know takes off from another important title um, by the feminist uh, sorry the by the British uh, writer Virginia Woolf, A Room of Her Own. Okay. So, a literature of her own is another landmark book. Um, you know, uh, published in the 20th century by Elaine uh, Showalter, in which she propounds the theory of gynocriticism. Gynocriticism, obviously, the word gyno from gynecology, gynocriticism or woman centered criticism, okay, in which she talked about various phases of you know, uh, you know, the uh, the feminine, the uh, the feminist female, for instance, various phases of of feminist writing, and then we had another important book, Susan, um, uh, uh, Sandra Gilbert and Susan Gubar's book, The Mad Woman in the Attic. Okay, the Mad Woman in the Attic is one of the you know is a uh, is a more detailed exploration. Okay, of of uh, writing by women. Okay, and the allusion, of course, here um, is uh, you know uh, uh, is to to the repressed female. Okay, the repressed female um, as being the mad woman who is in the attic, who is not accessible, who uh, one does not want to access. Okay, and who is labeled a mad woman. Okay, only uh, you know because of her subversive potential. Okay. Then we have uh, Luce Irigaray, a French feminist critic who uh, you know who propounded uh, the theory of écriture feminine or uh, feminine writing, okay, writing which celebrates uh, uh, you know uh, you know she uh, writing that that femi that celebrates a particularly female way of writing uh, and um, these are some of the uh, the critics who have who early on had you know established the field of feminist literary criticism. Okay. So, uh, but this is um, not really the entire story of uh, feminist literary criticism. Okay. Uh, A of course, is uh, even you know within, within this uh, discourse, we find that there are many 
feminist critics who in the larger cultural domain okay for instance not just literature in the larger cultural domain sought to look for instance a we have talked about power and representation but also issues like popular culture okay how are women represented in popular culture in films in popular fiction okay in theater for instance okay in the media the representation of of um, you know women and the uh, the attributes of the so called uh, you know uh, normative woman these are some of the ways in which feminist criticism looked into the representation then also female subjectivity and feminine subjectivity okay what is subjectivity subjectivity is uh, at least vis a vis identity subjectivity is 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 you know very simply put what it is like to be okay what it is like to be in this case what it is like to be a woman right we may extend this to ask questions like what is it like to be uh, a woman of color what is it like to be a woman from a certain region of the world or from a certain region in india for instance okay what does it mean what are the feelings what are the uh, you know um, or what are the understandings and what are the experiences of being a woman in a certain condition so the subjectivities particularly were the study of subjectivities was particularly uh, also helpful for the study of literary texts okay and particularly uh, say characters in novels or uh, you know female persona fem, uh, female persona in in poems for instance okay so how did it feel you seem to get a direct uh, in a look so to speak into the inner life of a woman okay there is an, in, an interesting book that i uh, i read um, by rama mehta um, inside the haveli okay so the haveli or if so if you look at uh, you know uh, other communities in the world like zenana for instance okay what does it mean to be what does it feel like to be uh, under a system of uh, what we call parda or what does it feel to be like a woman performing certain chores inside or having certain clear cut behavioral uh, you know norms in inside uh, uh, a haveli do you follow okay so these are some of the uh, you know more these are some of the richer areas in which a uh, feminist criticism found that they could talk a lot, a lot about consumption also in popular culture uh, consumption uh, what do women consume okay what are women allowed to consume and uh, what kind of things women are allowed to consume or not at all and finally of course given all these what are the identities that are given to women okay how is a women, how is a woman looked at and how does she perceive her own identity do you understand all these create a sort of a female identity which takes on different colors in different times and different um, you know in different uh, temporal situations now we i i mentioned this that you know uh, following the first phase uh, you know, of liberal and socialist feminism we also came across radical feminism okay uh, there was radical feminism psychoanalytic feminism feminisms of uh, you know uh, based on a difference in color for instance okay and we also have other kinds i found some different feminism now i'm going to go into that i mentioned an important point with which i would like to end this talk which is post feminism okay um, when we were uh, writing our you know doing our phd work um, this was not so much at least in india it was not so much in focus really we were still in the older discourses of elaine shaw alter um, uh, gilbert and gubar uh, also some of luce erigere for instance right but there is a clear shift here and we and this is indicated and by this very word post feminism now what is post feminist criticism does it mean that feminism has ended or is it uh, like the post in for instance uh, post structuralism where some of the tenets of structuralism lead to a post structuralist approach okay um, post feminism is uh, a a post enlightenment discourse now for this again obviously we have to go back to a, a term like enlightenment and what is enlightenment enlightenment is a way of thinking enlightenment is an ideology uh, enlightenment is a his, also a historical period okay in which uh, the the belief in uh, you know the belief in the potential of science of technology of reason and rationality okay was paramount and it was it was 
uh, a discourse in which everything was seen in, uh, in as being able to be conquered so to speak, in able to be accounted for so to speak by, uh, by science, reason and rationality. Okay? So, uh, many critics are of the opinion that these what they call grand narratives or these grand stories for instance are uh, given to us by Marxism and you know Marxism is uh, you know give, is a macro theory of uh, you know um, uh, of accounting for the structure as we saw the structure and change in societies. Okay. Um, uh, religion again is another grand, such grand theory do you follow. Okay. So, these are some of the ways in which there was a certainty, but in post feminism we find which also called queer studies that the, the difference between sex and gender is problematized here. Okay. Well, some of the main things here is the problematization of the sex gender dichotomy, the importance of representation in sexual identity, discourse and gender biological truths are access to discourse. This is very important if you look at the difference here, even biology we, we, we saw that when we defined uh, uh, gender as being not sex, here if in fact also the certainty of sex, the certainty of a biological identity is questioned and it is said that biological truths are also a matter of discourse. Okay? And the function of regulatory ways of speaking in the formation and determination of the sex bodies, okay? the regulatory following writer like Foucault for instance, the regulatory practices and make up uh, you know a gendered being, these are some of the important aspects, which again are feminist all right, but are post feminist in the sense for instance what of what the post feminist critic Judith Butler tells us, that gender is not our only identity as particles of other domains and discourses, we both belong to and not belong to particular discourses. And finally, she says gender is always a failure and accumulative fact of social relations that have become naturalized over time. She also says that this is the most important point, the gen point, the gender if you think you are um, masculine or feminine, it is an illusion. First she says it is a failure because it is an unattainable uh, ideal and it is also uh, an illusion of an abiding gender itself. If you think that I am feminine, then it is an illusion for the post feminist. Why? Because as she says here, the, the, read this, the effect of gender must be understood as the mundane ways in which bodily gestures, movements and styles constitute the illusion of an abiding self. Gender is an effect, it is an effect that is reiterated over and over again, so that it seems natural to us. Okay? It is a performance, the series of performances that are done by us. So, there is nothing ontological or essentially feminine, you know, in a even in a feminine person, okay? so called feminine person. Therefore, it becomes a critique of traditional feminism. Do you follow? So, uh, uh, from a queer studies perspective, okay, we then look at the regulatory practices and those silences and gaps in the text. Okay, when you are looking at a, you know, a, 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 a female you know, um, character, okay, how certain um, attributes that are neither male nor female are sort of silenced in the text and also silenced by the way we read the text and we miss those gaps in the text. Do you understand certain situations, certain episodes, events, lines of in, uh, in the dialogues given to them, these are uh, certain potentials that we have missed. So, this new school or this uh, you know new school of feminism exhorts us to look into those gaps and silences and to see uh, these things as not given, but as something that is an effect okay, much in the post structuralist manner. So, this is uh, really as I had said in the beginning uh, a very elementary you know um, way of looking at gender, I tried to show you how gender you know the uh, uh, you know the uh, traditional way of liberal and social feminism gave way to uh, feminist critics and uh, writers, theorists who wanted to move away from the male defined theories and have their own theories uh, via radical feminism uh, for instance, the feminism uh, you know of feminism of difference and feminism of color for instance. right? So, uh, for instance, if you get a question, let us see uh, what kind of questions you may get here. If you uh, are asked a question, right? why was the you know why was uh, what were the early uh, breakthroughs through made by feminists and then you would say that it is held that liberal feminism and social feminism which borrowed from the discourses, okay, which borrowed from the already existing liberal and socialist or so Marxist 
discourses that were already created by men and then uh, replaced a certain class uh, you know uh, you know um, uh, economic class uh, with the female uh, gender okay uh, these were the earlier um, uh, earlier discourses of feminism okay and then if the next question if you say what are the interventions that were made by uh, women by feminists by these theorists okay to carve out a niche or carve out, carve out a whole uh, not just not a niche to carve out really a whole um, uh, uh, you know a wholly opposite and you know um, a counter sort of discourse to the main discourse that was to the male discourse okay and then you say that feminism really broke not broke is not the word here uh, really um, uh, carved out several areas and several approaches and orientations like psychoanalytical criticism which was against the Freudian castration, castration complex or Oedipus complex models of looking at men and women understanding even children or, or characters in novels okay? uh, and uh, a far more nuanced way of looking. Uh, you know at um, uh, women through psychoanalysis then radical feminism that the way women began to talk about uh, the you know the differences within feminism okay the uh, the clear dismissal of a homogenized subjectivity of what it mean or what it means to be a woman okay because there are other variables here there are there's a variable of class variable of caste of race for instance and sexual orientation right following the um, lgbt movement the movement of the gay activist movement for instance these have uh, you know have uh, completely done away with the fact that the female experience is simply a homogenized experience or uh, you know all over the world uh, throughout different parts of the globe right then next is what are uh, what is patriarchy patriarchy is you get divided into two words the root words um, patriarch uh, pater meaning father and archy or rule of or rule by patriarchy is basically an ideology it's a worldview okay it is a power structure right it patriarchy is also ways of representation and patriarchy also is the way our material material lives are concerned and how does it help a feminist literary criticism these understandings help a feminist literary critic in trying to explore okay how a for instance women are represented in a literary text b what are the power dynamics between or among characters in a literary text okay uh, how what are the what are the details of you know power dynamics in the material lives of the characters and um, you know uh, uh, the subjectivities of female characters and also male characters the identities they are given uh, then also as i said looking at popular culture not simply canonized literature looking at popular culture finally we end uh, by asking a question on post feminism why was uh, why uh, do we have at all you know a feminist literary critical school known as post feminism today this came about with a you know with a clear attack on the earlier division of sex and gender the differentiation between sex and gender as sex being completely physical physiological and um, uh, biological and gender being a more of a social construct. Critics like Judith Butler said that even uh, sex that is biological definitions, descriptions are couched in a certain discourse. Okay? So, sex cannot be completely a biological thing, sex is also a discourse. Okay? So, again redefining the boundaries between sex and gender if gender is a discursive <coughs> activity so also according to these critics is sex okay <coughs> so let me end here and i hope this was useful uh, to you again let me remind you this is an elementary lecture those of you who are interested may go on to look at various aspects today the scenario is very different from what it was before it is a scenario in which you have a plethora of analytical tools and extremely exciting time to be doing feminism okay thank you